Live from Mountain View, California, it's The Q at OpenStack Silicon Valley, brought to you by headline sponsor, Mirantis. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley where all the innovation's happening. Uh, this is OpenStack SV, hashtag OpenStack SV. Go to crowdchat.net slash OpenStack SV. Join the conversation. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. My co-host Jeff Frick with theCUBE. Uh, we're here pleased to have uh, CUBE alumni and friend who've known SiliconANGLE from the beginning. Uh, James Waters, storied career, uh, VMware, and now VP of product at Pivotal, uh, or Cloud Foundry Pivotal, I guess Cloud Foundry is the official product, but at Pivotal, part of the Federation. Uh, James, uh, welcome back. Hey Good John. to see you. I know yeah. you're super busy. Thanks for making the time. <laughs> yeah, great. Great to be here. It was nice to sneak out for an afternoon and uh, catch a little conference time. So, VP of product, that's like the, the head honcho. I see you speaking with Moritz. You're out there leading the charge. You're out gathering requirements. You're trying to understand the shifting markets. The tectonic plates are happening. Earthquakes in Napa. I mean, the cloud business is, is pretty grinding right now. It's a heavy lift. Yeah, I think you know, the interesting thing about my role right now is it's definitely enterprise sales. So we've, we focus on the Fortune 500 primarily, and I spend a lot of time in airplanes, maybe 40, 50% with customers, taking customer meetings. People are using it, people are prospects. And it's just been an interesting tour of the global economy and the global way people use technology, if nothing else. It's a very hands-on business at, at the high end. So we were just talking about the cloud evolution. Obviously, public cloud Amazon's winning across the board. They're lowering prices, increasing functionality. And now you got in the enterprise, they're not born in the cloud like the DevOps that, that we know. All yeah. of our friends have, are born in the cloud DevOps ninjas. But enterprise are born in the, on the, in the data center, born in, on premise. Right. But now the hybrid cloud is key. So, so obviously, that's your, your vector. That's um, it. Is we essentially try to take the, the patterns that you normally find in cloud native applications, but we bring that as an enterprise platform. So we say to them, look, you don't have to go out and reinvent your platform and discover your tool chain and spend five years inventing it like Google and Facebook did. We'll give you an out of the box enterprise edition of a, a, a way to run cloud applications and scale them out, um, do agile, continuous delivery, things like that. Really hit all of those buttons for an enterprise so that you can faithfully go to a, you know, a CTO who's running an innovation team and say, this is your net new platform you can go build out your next generation of applications on um, and get a radically different economics of running them and deploying them. So the, the public cloud um, is a different animal. Compare and contrast with the folks out there who are trying to grok uh, Cloud Foundry. In yeah. Because you have a lot of biz dev deals you've done with IBM, Bluemix, yeah. others. Um, there's a biz dev land and expand, get the relationships, get more goodness flowing. But sure. what's the differentiation between public and I don't want to say private, but hybrid cloud yeah. essentially is the private cloud. If, if you think about, you know, Amazon is, you know, who, who is Amazon hurting? I think Amazon hurts, frankly, custom companies like Dell. Like if you imagine Dell used to be, hey, I'm going to go to a website, I'm going to order my own server and they'll ship it to me, right? That's Amazon now, right? You go to Amazon, you make a couple of web services calls and you've got it. So they've really disrupted that server distribution market very effectively and I think to a, lo a large extent that's changed even the way software adapts above that layer. Um, but if you think about what platform as a service and platform is disrupt, it's much more about Oracle and Oracle's middleware stack. Like, what am I going to write applications to? How am I going to think about my application container? How am I going to think about failover? How am I going to do service discovery? How am I going to do scale out of my applications? How do I think about that architecture? So we're much more disruptive, um, and it's a little bit you know, longer term play against companies like Oracle that have been selling that application middleware. So Red Hat was just on talking about, uh, I said, is Cloud Foundry trying to boil the ocean over, which we know is a tech vernacular for taking on too much. Some say no, some say do. Um, and the, uh, uh, Tim, Tim Crawford said, and she actually didn't say you were boiling over, I said that, that was my words. And sure. she said, they're not boiling over anything. And then Tim said, if Cloud Foundry's boiling the ocean, could the same be said for Red Hat? Um, and then she said, um, you're duct taping Bosch together. Is that, is that a fair assessment, building around that? Um, and, and what is your focus? I mean, Cloud Foundry is pretty much everywhere. You're doing a lot, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of uh, partnerships. We're having a huge first year in the enterprise and selling it. I mean, I think the reason so many competitors are obsessed with us and you know, when I walk around right now, I kind of get looks and like, hey, what's going on with these guys? 
is because we're popping up in a lot, of, a lot of accounts. If you think about the relationships that VMware and EMC have, the level of trust they have in bringing out new products and new architectures, um, they're able to really look a CTO in the eye and say, with the Federation, we're going to take you on this cloud journey for your whole application portfolio. And that's really, that's really powerful. Um, and you guys not hold, held back on any, you're not like quiet when it comes to marketing. You're out marketing heavily. We are, we are here to win and we're winning, is the way I would describe it. And what Cloud Foundry does that's so compelling and some people might say uh, ambitious, but it's why it's been fun to work on for me for four years now. This is my fourth, this month is my four year anniversary of working on the product, which is unbelievable to me to think about that, yeah. how old I am. Um, is that when you install us, we use cloud APIs, so that's why I'm here at OpenStack Conference. We use the APIs to completely set up the platform and scale the platform. So we don't say, hey, if you want to install Cloud Foundry, come along with some Puppet or some Chef or some of your homemade scripts and install it yourself, good luck. We're like, look, we now know that we can procure that server with an API call. So let's take advantage of that and set ourselves up completely. What about Mesosphere and what they're doing? Flow, yeah. Yeah, Flow is on early, he's an awesome guy. Yeah. I saw Flo here for the first time maybe two years ago giving a, a cool talk about what he was up to at Airbnb. Um, and I've talked with him about collaborating and I think you know, there might be some future there. If you think about what they're doing, they're more disruptive to something like OpenStack because they're saying, why would you think of the world in terms of virtual machines representations? You can think of it in terms of pure processes that you schedule across any number of different containers. So I think it'll be interesting to see how OpenStack versus Mesosphere plays out kind of as a scheduling war. So obviously um, Docker's financing was pretty huge news, and pretty much leaked out earlier. 40 million, they haven't been around for a year with funding. Um, Doc Cloud got kind of spun off. They're all in on the container. What's your take on that? Uh, hype, obviously developers are loving it, um, and your relationship with Docker and... Yeah, we're, we're really thrilled about it. You know, Docker's a member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, and Cloud Foundry runs applications and it gives us a whole other unit of currency when you start expressing those applications as Docker files in addition to just WAR files. So before you gave us a Ruby, a Ruby app and we ran it, but now you could actually specify everything about that Ruby app in terms of the, the packaging of it and the um, runtime context and push that as a Docker image. And we did this pretty cool uh, demo uh, called Diego the new component called Diego, we did a great demo of it, where we push a Docker image, we scale it up to 300 instances running, all load balanced, all health managed with logging coming out. So we can do really impressive things now, both with applications or Docker images. And I would really say that Docker is much more like GitHub as a company in terms of enabling that developer workflow than they are like VMware. And I think a lot of people confuse them for the next VMware when they're much closer in heart um, to that developer workflow like GitHub is. Well, a little bit higher up on the stack in terms of applications, VMware might be lower under the hood. Right, like people think that you know, Docker's just about the container, but it's really about that, that workflow of how do you get an image into the container. In fact, when Docker started, it was just using LXC, which is the generic Linux container we'd always had. The thing about Docker is amazing. They crack the code on the developer flywheel and also the, bent, the little, little nuance on how developer communities are incented, but also they're great for stateless applications. VMware can win on stateful applications. So, you know, I was talking to Pat Gelsinger and also Bill Fathers, and I'm like, dude, is this a little secret? Am I, am I opening up like the secret, you know, play here? And they're like, oh. But if you think about it, that's what enterprises, they, a lot of stateful applications. Docker's phenomenal for stateless. Yeah, I mean, and that's why we use it. We use it as a stateless application within Cloud Foundry. That's what it does well for us. Um, and we wrap services around it. But if you think about the billions and billions of dollars that have been invested in storage and networking around the virtual machine paradigm, it's non-trivial. So I think that's where the container community is just getting started, is starting to think about you know, how they're going to do storage and networking um, in a really robust enterprise grade way. And I think that'll be, a, that'll be a, long, a long mission for them. There was a great tweet by a guy who's an engineer at Heroku. He said, the only thing that Heroku's taught me is the incredible difference for a stateless container system and a stateful container system, because they've got Heroku apps and they've got Heroku Postgres. So yeah. they've got some mileage on containers. Well, I mean, if, if the API there. economy plays out, which it will, yep. that's obvious, that trajectory is, unless there's some force majeure, something happens that's weird, it's going <laughs> to come home. Yep. It's going to happen. That's good for apps, because then now that becomes the key interoperability between the data and apps. Yeah. And then let other stuff under the hood happen. I get that. Um, so I want to ask you with that as a kind of lead in, you know, we've been talking for now almost six years, we've known each other uh, or more. Um, 2008. The, the platform as a service was a huge battleground. It was a wrestling match 
Because everyone was trying to say, okay, Amazon's got infrastructure as a service, but now PaaS doesn't seem to be as competitive. It seems to be a nice little coexistence going on. I mean, it's competitive. No, I mean, but I wrote a blog, the, I wrote a blog changed? just last week. And I, I think the venture capitalists took a false positive when Heroku was acquired and just started pouring money into these public PaaS companies that were Heroku-like. And if you look, those companies were CloudBees, DotCloud, AppFog, StackMob, Parse. And all of those companies now have pivoted to offer another smaller tool. In the case of DotCloud, it's now Docker. And they offered a much smaller, simpler tool that is compatible with Cloud Foundry. We just announced CloudBees, and they're going to become a Jenkins service for Cloud Foundry. So you either went really big and developed a huge ecosystem the way we tried to play it, or you had to become kind of a niche, uh, smaller offering and pivot to something smaller and more contained. Well, it really came down to, if you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if you want to go in and own the stack, you had to be really aggressive and own it, or you dance around the stack. Yeah. And so what you're saying is these companies realize, hey, I don't want to fight that battle, I'll get behind it, player X, and I'll play it, in that. It's really similar to what happened with OpenStack versus Eucalyptus versus Nimbula versus, remember, the, remember there are 10 yeah. companies that competed with OpenStack? Yeah. And now it's pretty much just OpenStack, right? Well, those companies now are three years into their funding. You meant, we were talking before we get on, some other companies that are that, you know, billing for two years. Some of these might not play out. I mean, some of these might not make it, so the word pivot will be around for more consolidation uh, for those companies. But also the move with Eucalyptus to HP is a big signal, and recently the cloud stack is going on its final chapter, so everything's happening within the open stack, right? So do you see anything different from that picture? I think the thing about platforms of service is in that layer, you have to have huge money for R&D to really build the whole stack that people need and then you need huge money for go to market and sales because it's an enterprise product. So if you try to build a company without both of those, you could be in pretty big trouble. So we think it's a big boys game. In the same way, frankly, that Google and Amazon building infrastructure is a big boys game, right? Well, you don't see a lot of startups. Too. Ro Google's yeah. rolling into town now. Yeah, absolutely, and they're here, they're here to disrupt Amazon. It's one of the most interesting things to watch for me, yeah. actually, is... The Kubernetes was a very interesting um, discussion. Uh, what's yeah. your take on that? Yeah, what did you, I mean, it's an interesting thing because Craig and the Kubernetes team is really trying to bring container-based systems to the world, just like Google's run for years. So I think what they did was smart in the same way that we did it before at VMware is we offered an open source standard around our way of doing things, but we invited the community to contribute and share in it. That's something that Amazon hasn't done well. Like if you think like DynamoDB, yeah. they don't have an open source version of DynamoDB where they invite a community around it. I think Amazon could really, really potentially set themselves up to be a Microsoft-like monoculture over time. And that's interesting to think about that Seattle DNA and the inability to share. Well, both firms are not here at this event. Right, like if- Azure and it, AWS. I think if, if you are, do not have an open source aspect to your product, and you really want to cater to developers and develop infrastructure standards, it's, it's a high risk mission over time. James Waters here inside theCUBE, uh, VP of product. Uh, been fun to watch your career. This is your, this is your swan song right now, is, to, is to Cloud Foundry. You're, you're all in on Cloud Foundry, right? Four years in. Are you in, all in? Four years in, all <laughs> in, and it, it couldn't be a better year for me. Uh, we're going to talk to HP uh, here in theCUBE. They're all in as well on OpenStack. Congratulations on all your success. It's fun to watch you, uh, uh, you know, really take the, the, your original vision. Uh, we, we talked about early days, and and make it a reality, a pivotal, and congratulations, good luck, and uh, keep us updated on all the events. James Waters, VP of Products uh, and Marketing and Ecosystem for Cloud Foundry here inside theCUBE. We'll be right back live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, Jeff Frick, we'll be right back.